Well, greetings, welcome in. We are so grateful that you chose this opportunity to see our First Grace morning worship celebrations together. We hope that this can be a resource for you in conjunction with belonging to and being known by a local church fellowship. By no means does this substitute that, and we pray that you, wherever you are, would be able to find that. We are so excited about the opportunity to study the scriptures together and we hope that this can be a resource for you. If you have been blessed by the ministries of First Grace as well, you can give back at www.firstgrace.com slash online giving, and we would love to be able uh, to see that investment go forward in ministry. So God bless you, and we hope that you are edified and delight in the scriptures as we study them together today. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Check, check, check. Testing one, two. Can you all hear me out there? Apparently two of you can. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Well, yesterday was a true joy to have the opportunity to be able to serve our community. I truly believe, and I hope that you believe this as well, that ministry can start here within the four walls of this church, but it really begins as we launch out of here. The church is you and me. God calls us as individuals, his church, his holy people. We are his temple and we take the presence of God everywhere we go. As we go out to eat, as we spend time with friends and family, as we bless our community, we take the church out of here and we go and we bless others. So, so excited about that opportunity yesterday to serve in our community and continuing to pray for more opportunities. And I would just beckon and call each one of you to step into that because that's really where we want to go. You remember our four goals from last year that we laid out. It's been amazing to see how the Lord has already started these things into motion. We covenanted together that within five years from last fall that we wanted to see 100 disciples made who would be capable of making other disciples. We covenanted together as well that we wanted to be a part of raising up a church and a mission field in some new place in an unreached people group. We covenanted and are praying together. And the reason I'm putting this before you is because this is a team effort. Your pastors will work to lead and to shepherd us in the right direction. But this is something that each one of us steps into together to pray over and ask the Lord to do this in our midst. The third thing was that we would be a part of raising up five Christian leaders within the next five years that would step into vocational ministry. And our fourth goal was that we would be a part of some church revitalization effort. And we saw even this year in a way that we could have never manufactured how Brother Bill was called into a ministry over in Phillipsburg that needed revitalizing. Bless the Lord, praise him how he does these things. And he sends out, and in ways that we could never manufacture, we could never control, God does a powerful work. The reason I put those things before you is because these are ongoing things that we want to work towards as a church, covenant and pray with us as we ask the Lord to do this work. Well, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Psalm 103. This morning we are spending time in Psalm 103. And as you turn there, I want to commend to you this Uh, effort that we've been doing in a lot of our Bible studies and discipleship relationships, something that Pastor Tim, myself, and I know a lot of our ladies as well are wanting to develop is this capacity to memorize and meditate on the word of God. It's so important for us to not just read and see the text, but also to memorize and meditate and think about the way in which the word has an impact on our lives. As I was preparing and thinking about this sermon, I took it upon myself to memorize and meditate on Psalm 103, and I want to give it to you uh, this morning as you read. This is the Psalm of David, 103, reading of God's word. David writes, starting with verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? 
who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. For he knows our frame. And he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. But when the wind comes, it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord establishes his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all the places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your beautiful word and your attributes put on display for us. We are not worthy to enter into this beautiful relationship with you that you beckon us into. God, thank you for the way that you pour out your benefits on our lives. You heal us. You forgive us. You love us steadfastly. God, I pray that as we spend time here in Psalm 103, that you would allow us to soak in your truth, to preach to our own hearts the realities of who you are and not what the world says. God, that we would press in to what it means to follow you with devotion and love. I pray, Lord, that you would allow me to not speak my own opinion this morning, but to speak clearly your word and explain it in a way that's understandable that only your spirit can do. God, we invite your presence here. We invite you to speak to your church. This church belongs to you. This people belongs to you. We commit ourselves into your hands. In your name we pray, amen. Well, blessed God, amen. We didn't trip up, God is good. Psalm 103, listen, our main idea for the text is as we spend time here is to remember the attributes of God. Remember the attributes of God and apply them to your personal and communal lives. Psalm 103 is a beautiful tapestry of truth of who God is in the way that he relates to us. The attributes of God apply to us very practically. And you could say that Psalm 103 in many ways is God's attributes in action. It's amazing how we read the Bible and sometimes God can seem very distant. Sometimes God can seem inaccessible. But as we read Psalm 103, we see a relational God 
who interacts with his people, who loves his people with devotion and fervency. The benefits of God, and that is our sermon title this morning. It's know Christ, know his benefits. Know Christ and know his benefits. Well, as we look at the opening, we see this discussion about benefits. First of all, Psalm 103 verses one and two is the opening praise. Bless the Lord. You might ask the question if you're reading in the English standard like I am this morning, bless the Lord. You might say, what is it that I have to bless God with? (laughs) Well, the, the term bless the Lord could also be interpreted or translated as praise the Lord. God, we give you all blessing, all honor, all praise, all worship is the idea here at the beginning and the end of the psalm. Because when you truly understand who God is and you understand his works on display in the center of the psalm, then the right response from his people is praise and blessing and giving him glory and honor that he is due. So he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. You might even say, everything that I am, all that is within me, that all of my entity, my inner man, everything that I have is giving praise and glory to the Lord. That we bless his holy name. I love the call here from David at the very beginning of the psalm because this is how we understand these powerful truths of Psalm 103. If your prayer at the beginning of the psalm is not a reality, then these benefits of God walking with us will not be realized in your life. When we take this posture of worship and praise at the onset, then all that God has for you can be poured out in love and care as we enter into this relationship with him. He says in verse two, forget not all his benefits. You might say that this psalm is a psalm of remembrance in many ways of who God is, how he displays himself and how he works among his people. So thinking about benefits, how many of you, if you don't mind me asking, with a show of hands would say, I have a job or have had a job at some point in my life with this thing called benefits. What do we think of when we hear this terminology, benefits? Okay, most, most of you here. So when you think of benefits with a job, it means what? Health care, maybe retirement. It's the added things. So you get your hourly wage, right? What's expected. And then the job gives benefits. And when you hear, you know, you're going to get paid this much an hour. And then, mm, boom, benefits. Oh, praise God, right? That's cool. You know, so you get this amount and then you get benefits. Well, I suddenly found out that this year I was going to be an adult and for the first time get a job with some benefits at the township. I was like, praise God, bless the Lord. I get to have a doctor now and all of those things. I guess I finally arrived, finally get to be an adult. Well, benefits, it's an overflow of, of what you already uh, have as like the, the set uh, pay or something along those lines. Well, when we think about the benefits of God, how much greater are the benefits of God poured out as we think about how he operates, all his benefits, so much greater than any health care, any insurance policy, any retirement funding that you might receive in this life are the benefits of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured out on our lives. Forget not all his benefits. Imagine that. Imagine if I had gotten that job at the township and just said, well, I'm not going to use those things. Well, pff, that's silly. That would have been stupid. I want to have access to all the benefits that I have received. And it's the same thing in our relationship with the Lord. Forget not all his benefits poured out on his people. So we see at the beginning, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then the author begins to step into personal benefits from God. And that's our point number one. And we're gonna see this in Psalm 103, verses one through eight. Personal benefits. God, a personal God. It's powerful to see, and I hope to be able to show this to you, how we look through the psalm and the beginning part shows you the personal nature of God in his 
interaction with us on an individual level. But then you're going to see that it doesn't just stay there, but that God continues to pour out on a communal level as well. But if you'll notice in verse three, he says, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. This is singular, pouring out of his benefits. I love verse three. If you look down at the text and I would encourage you, if you don't already bring your Bible to open that up and to soak in it, because listen, I could say all kinds of things up here, but you know, you can be the independent fact checker, ready to go. It's right there. Use it. God has given us all his word and it's powerful for you to be able to see and savor the beauty of who God is revealed in his word. Well, verse three says, he forgives your iniquity and heals all your diseases. I love this because this is a complete God. He does not simply forgive of sin, but also heals of physical diseases. Not only does he give you physical healing in some regard or another, but also completely heals your inner soul and who you are at the core. Our God is complete in every way and he wants to minister to us in all aspects and all regards of our lives. When we see Jesus, Jesus would interact with individuals. I love it when the the crippled man is brought down out of the ceiling by his friends. And what is the first thing that Jesus says? He says, my brother, your, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees question and they say, you know, who are you? Who are you to forgive sins? And Jesus says, well, just to see, just to show you that the son of man has authority to forgive sins, is it easier for me right now to say, get up and walk? So you can see this get up and walk. The man gets up and walks immediately. So you see right there a visible representation of verse three, forgiveness of sin from Jesus Christ, healing of disease in his body. It's amazing how we serve a God who heals completely. He wants to fix all inside of us, complete eternal healing, forgives all your iniquity, heals all your diseases. And not only does he do this, but he redeems your life from the pit. You could say he pulls us out of our eternal damnation. He pulls us out of this place where we're ultimately headed without his love and care given to us. He redeems our life from the pit. And then I love this in verse four, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. If you have a pen and you're looking at your Bible, I would encourage you to underline this. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. We're going to see as we march through this psalm that steadfast love and mercy is at the core of who God is displayed in this psalm. The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. This is his character. But Look at verse four. He says that he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. So not only does he redeem your life from the pit, does he pull you from the brink, but then he says, I will crown you with my very own essence and character put on you as my treasure and as my people. So he heals us and he draws us out. He takes care of us. He redeems us from the pit. And then he says, not only that, but I'm going to crown you with my very character and purposes. Isn't that good? I love it. Praise the Lord. Listen, he says, and I preached this. This was, I think it was my last sermon to you all back in February in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He calls us, what? A, a royal priesthood. Royal. A holy nation. A people for his own possessions that we might proclaim his excellencies among the nations. Bless the Lord. He calls us his royalty poured out on him. So he crowns us. How does he crown us? With his character. He pours it out on us. He does this work. You can't do this on your own. You've got to allow him to heal you. You've got to allow him to do that work. And then he will crown you with his love, with his mercy. Be willing to accept that have to be willing to receive that. And then he will do a work. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. Somebody needs that. (laughs) Verse five, he satisfies you with good. 
so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, satisfies. You think about our culture right now, you think about how everyone around us is never satisfied, continually trying to get more and more and more, always trying to get the latest and greatest. What are we up to iPhone 75 at this point? You know, always trying to get the, the newest kind of technology, the best and greatest movies. They're getting longer, I think. You know, it used to be that the old movies were super long and now they're getting to be three, four hours long again. I think we need to get some three, four hour long sermons. Anybody, anybody got a witness? Yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> Listen, it's amazing how we're never satisfied in this life. We're always pursuing after more. There's always a greater adrenaline rush. There's always a bigger house. There's always a better job. There's always a better movie. There's always something, a better relationship, a better marriage, a better friendship. There's always something that we're looking towards, something that we're pursuing after. And God says, I will be the one who satisfies you. I will satisfy you with good. We're satisfied when we press into him and allow him to take us in and pour out his blessing on us. That's where ultimate satisfaction and peace comes from. Not from us pursuing the things of this world that will never satisfy. You gotta say, I'm not going there, but I'm pressing in and allowing God to be the one who satisfies me with good. I want you to notice from verses three through five right here, this is very personal. And this is also very repetitive. And he's continuing to build his case for God's attributes being poured out on you. Who forgives, who redeems, who satisfies. This is our God. This is the one we're praising. This is the one we're in relationship with. And he says, just in case you're not convinced, verse six is the underlying of all of this. The Lord, he works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He's made known his ways to Moses his acts to the people of Israel. And then verse eight, if you have read your Old Testament or you've spent time in his word for any length of time, verse eight will sound familiar. The uh, Old Testament reader would have a lot of bells going off with verse eight because this is something that tracks through the entire Old Testament as the character and attributes of God. And here's what he says. By the way, this God, the one revealed to Moses and the children of Israel, that one, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He's reminding them of these attributes of God that have always been and that always will be. This was him from the beginning of time and this will always be him until the end of the age. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. If you look in your Old Testament, I'm gonna take us on a little odyssey here so that you can see this displayed throughout the Old Testament. If you wanna flip there, you can. Otherwise, it's on the screen behind you if you wanna stay in Psalm 103. But he, in Exodus 34, here's Moses. Moses is on the mountain. He's having relationship with God. God is revealing himself to him. And here in Exodus 34, the Lord passed before him, being Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Do you see this? This is the exact terminology that David is picking up on to remind the readers of the character of God. He is keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. You might say, well, I like half of that. The other half sounds a little bit scary. God is both just and righteous and loving and merciful, all put in to one beautiful package and display of authority and power. This is our God. The psalmist is purposefully here revealing to us these attributes of God that are mercy, grace, slow to anger, because guess what? There are seasons where you need to hear that. But then I'll also wager there are seasons where you need to know that God is just 
and that there is a necessary payment for our iniquity. And his name is Jesus Christ. In Numbers chapter 14, this comes back up again where the children of Israel have slipped into sin and Moses appeals to God on their behalf. And here's what he says. Now, please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. In Numbers 14, that is such an interesting passage because God relents when Moses intercedes and intervenes. I challenge you to go check that out. God answers prayers and he listens and he also listens when we advocate for his character and we know his attributes and we say, God, we know that this is the God that you are. You are a God who forgives. You are a God who shows mercy. And we know this to be true. We see the same thing at the end of second Chronicles. Hezekiah quotes this again. And he says at the end, For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to this land. For the Lord, your God is, guess what? Gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. This is the character of God that continues to be traced through. Don't believe me yet. Nehemiah chapter nine, verse 17. They refuse to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. They stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. This is the God of the Old Testament, friends. Well, the God of the Old Testament, he's all wrath and anger and holiness. lies. He is a God slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love to his people. Loves, pours out his blessing. Joel chapter two, verse 13, rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This is the core of the character of Yahweh. He relents over disasters. Jonah chapter four. Jonah knows the character of God. He knows that God is slow to anger. He knows that he's merciful and he refuses to go to Nineveh because he doesn't believe that the Ninevites are worthy of it. And here's what he says in chapter four, verse two. He prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish for I knew that you are a gracious God. Merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting over disaster. He says, these people don't deserve it. These people don't deserve your graciousness. Well, listen, he didn't understand his own sin. Sometimes we don't either. It's powerful. You see this tracked all the way through your Old Testament over and over and over and over, brought up the character of God. And listen, When we see that this is who God is, this is also how Jesus beautifully embodies the completeness and the complete character of God on display in the Old Testament. Jesus, this just, righteous individual who also loves and shows mercy and compassion for people who come to him. He does not do away with the law. He does not do away with righteousness. He himself puts his own body in the place of you and I and takes on our iniquity and our sin to pay the payment that you and I couldn't pay. Because why? Because God is righteous and he will not forgive the iniquity. And so there has to be payment. But Jesus himself stepped in so that God's attributes of mercy and love and steadfast love and grace could be poured out on you and me. Isn't that good? Praise God. He does this work 
First John chapter one, verse nine then says, if we confess, and I promised point number one was the longest one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so what we see then popping up in the New Testament is that this same God, Yahweh, working with the people of Israel, is, is now applying these attributes to his people, the church. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We don't serve a God who's always storming around in wrath against your sin. He is just, he is good, and he will not stand for our unrighteousness and our unholiness. And we do have to submit that to Jesus Christ but he is also loving, merciful, and guess what? He knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. He knows. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. The east never meets the west. I don't know if I need to draw that conclusion for you. (laughs) The heavens never meet the earth. That's how great his steadfast love is exaggeration and hyperbole to help you understand it is immeasurable, unable to be fathomed the way in which he pours out his forgiveness and love on those who fear him and love him in depth of relationship. I have one more verse I wanna show you and then we'll move into our next point. And I would encourage you as well to connect 2 Peter chapter 1, three through four to Psalm 103, Verse four, here's what Peter writes about Jesus and what Jesus does. And I hope to continue to come back to this. Here's what the apostle Peter writes. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires, who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with the very essence and attributes of God, his steadfast love, and mercy. He has granted to us the capacity to become partakers of the divine nature. By Psalm 103 is defined as steadfast love and mercy of God poured out on you and me. So what Peter then does is through Jesus Christ and through his promises and through the work on the cross, then he allows us as his followers to enter in and to be partakers of this powerful divine nature. He does this work in us. You can't do that. I'll tell you what, allowing God to do this work in you is so much easier than trying to force all of this on your strong will and capacity to be a morally upright person. So much better to love God and to allow him to do the crowning instead of you always having to crown yourself with the things that God calls righteous rags. Number two, he is a communal God. Back in Psalm 103, starting with verse 9 and 16, it's really interesting. If you notice, if you're looking down at your Bible, you'll see that he moves from you and your to us and our. Moves from the singular to the plural. And I think that in and of itself will preach because we serve a God who is not only an individual personal savior, but we also serve a God who recognizes community and communal realities with the church, with the people of Israel, his people. It's a community. Your walk with the Lord will directly impact those around you, whether it's fired up, lit, going for for God's best, or struggling, always down in the dumps, allowing yourself to slip spiritually in your walk with him. Your interaction with God will affect the way in which those around you fellowship with the Lord as well. 
your ability to press in to the church, to get involved, has the capacity to greatly affect and help those around you. Your inability to plug in and your unwillingness to have community and to be known by the church can handicap others from knowing the beautiful benefits of Christ poured out on his people. God wants to use you and he wants you to step in to being able to serve others and step into a community reality that God has for each one of us. We had this growing up in our home. I don't know if this was true in your home or not, but uh, punishment, forgiveness, uh, all of those things were uh, communal realities in our home. Let me explain to you what I, what I mean by that. When, uh, when we would have privileges or things that we would be enjoying as, as kids or something that our parents would be giving to us, if one of us decided that day that they weren't gonna be sweet and that they were gonna have an attitude, they were gonna be uh, struggling through some things, then everybody got punished in the sense that if one of us <laughs> was being bad, all of us didn't get to experience the privilege, right? So I would be bad and then the rest of the, of the, the family would say, okay, well, I guess we're not doing this privilege. Listen, <laughs> it's the same thing in the sense that when all of us would do well, then we would all be blessed versus when one of us would sin, so to speak, is that then all of us would be punished. That was not always the case, but it was largely the case in our family as we did everything together. And you know that that's still very much true about our family even now. Uh, But it's amazing to see how God does that so much more even with his church in the way that maybe you might feel like your relationship with the Lord is very personal and the sins that you struggle with is all about you. The reality is your sin greatly affects those around you and God's punishment and love is bestowed on people communally. And here's what we see in Psalm 103. Look at this. Verse 11, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Notice this. This is a community. This is Israel here that he's talking to. And I'd say would also greatly apply to the church. And so when we as a group, as a church, ask for God's forgiveness for our sin and we repent, then God pours out his blessing on us. When we refuse and do not walk in fear of the Lord, he will not, he will withhold his blessing from us. As we read earlier in Joel chapter two, it's powerful. It's been really cool to see as the last few months, as we have gotten to some more intimate levels in our Monday night men's discipleship group. And for those of you, if you do not have a men's Bible study group, what we do in Cafe Grace at 7 p.m. on Mondays has been incredibly encouraging. It's been awesome to see as well how as the men have stepped forward to confess and repent over sin, how all of us then begin to receive and see spiritual breakthrough. Because as one gets victory, it is an encouragement and a challenge to their brothers. And it's amazing to see on display the way in which the relationship that one has with the Lord greatly impacts and affects the relationship that God has with the entire group. Poured out in the way that when we get victory, it reverberates in the church. It has effects on those around you. God may be looking for you to get victory so that he can use you to bring victory in the lives of those around you in the church or maybe even simply your family or those around you who so desperately need Jesus. Communal realities. As we see and march through the rest of this section here, you see that God is forgiving. Look at verse 12 and 13. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. You might need to underline that. You might need to write that one on your heart. You might need to put it up in your kitchen, in your living room, to understand that your past 
sin, when you have asked for the Lord's forgiveness, is forgiven and gone in the eyes of God. It's amazing how we so easily allow condemnation to continue to be brought upon ourselves when we need to release it to Jesus Christ and say, God, I'm not going there anymore. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your condemnation will reach up and grab you and take you back to that dark place every time if you allow it. It will rob you of the capacity to step into the way that God wants you to serve and meet the needs of others. Do not allow yourself to believe the character of God is something other than what it is. We we allow our experience with humanity to judge the way that we understand God, and it's awful. Because man remembers. Man remembers the sin, remembers who you were. Man remembers what kind of person you were before you submitted your life to Christ. It's God that only sees Jesus. When Jesus truly covers your life and you've submitted to him, he clothes you with righteousness. Let that be what's on display and walk forward with confidence, knowing that he has clothed you. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Understand though, Psalm 103 verses one through two must be true in order for verse 11 to be true. Because I have seen, and you might be able to testify to this, I've seen a lot of people saying I'm forgiven and then going back to their sin and completely walking in unrighteousness and not worshiping God. But when verse one and two are in place and you say, bless the Lord, Lord, praise the Lord, all that is within me worships his holy name. Then when that is true for your life, then verse 11 is a reality. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. When you walk in a place of worship and submission and repentance, God's character is then put on display with complete forgiveness and love poured out on you. He's ready to pour it out. Know Christ, know his benefits. What are his benefits? Complete forgiveness and love poured out on his people. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. I want you to notice a couple repeated terms throughout this psalm. One of them is steadfast love. Steadfast love shows up in verse four, shows up in verse eight, Shows up in verse 11, shows up in verse 17, his steadfast love. What is this word? This is the Hebrew word, otherwise known as chesed. This is covenant loyalty. It's translated as loving kindness. It's translated as mercy. It's translated as steadfast love. The reason it's translated into all of these different words is because it's a difficult concept for us to understand in the English language. And what it means is loyal, faithful love. Loyal, faithful love. It's the term that God uses for the way that Yahweh is covenantly faithful in the way that Israel is not. Covenant loyalty. He is faithful when you are not. This is why we sang great as his faithfulness this morning. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. He is faithful even when you and I are faithless. The Apostle Paul writes in Timothy. We know that he is faithful and his love is steadfast. Always there always consistent. He does not move. He does not leave. Even when your experience has been that the love of men and of everyone else around you is fleeting, God's love is consistent and will always be there. And you can count on it by saying, I fear the Lord. And I want you to notice this as well, because paired with steadfast love in verse 11 is to those who fear him, reverence, honor, awe. If you do not walk in fear of the Lord, you cannot count on his attributes being 
poured out on you. Fear of the Lord does not mean being scared of God, but it does mean a proper reverence. We live in a society that is increasingly irreverent. Every comedy that you ever watch pushes all kinds of irreverent behavior and crass terminology and things said that ought not to be said. People making fun of Jesus, using his name in vain, making fun of Christianity and the way in which we worship. Listen, friends, we serve a God who is worthy of fear. And there should be a proper reverence as we understand his presence. Do not slip into making light of God's power and authority. Don't go there. Allow yourself to walk in fear, knowing that he is the one who is in complete control, has all authority and is worthy of our complete honor. Growing up as a child, I wouldn't have dreamed of making light of my father. Proper fear was important in our home and he demanded it of us. And it was good and it was loving. Praise God for the way in which I saw an example in my father of one who demanded, he demanded it of us, that we walk in reverence of his authority. And so as a result, when he said do this, most of the time we would do this. Reverence, that is the way, and he's not perfect by the way, but God is. Amen. And praise the Lord that he has displayed many wonderful attributes of God in my life. Fear, it's good. Fear of the Lord, it's loving. Honor him, obey him. We walk in obedience when we fear God. When we fear who he is and we walk in awe, we obey because we know there's no other way. We know that his way is good. Well, as you track down and you see, he starts to talk about how man's days are gone quickly. And as we were reading this, you might have had bells going off if you're a lover of Isaiah of chapter 40. If you look at Isaiah chapter 40, here's what he says. All flesh is grass, he says in verse six. All its beauty is like the flower of the field, Hearing something there? It's amazing how the Bible, by the way, quotes itself. It works its way all through these, these themes. And who is that? That's the Spirit of God. Because there is no way that you can tell me that 30 plus different authors across 2,000 years with three different languages across three different continents all have the same story and say all of these same things about the characters and attributes of God throughout the entire text. That is absurd and not possible except by the Spirit of God working through and speaking through yes. the voice of these men as they wrote. Yes. Praise God for his word. Its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the bread, breath of the Lord Bread would be good too. Blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. I love bread, by the way. That's why I said that would be good. But anyway, it's powerful to see the way in which God is everlasting. His word stands true, even as our lives are gone like a mist. He, in contrast to us, is consistent. He is good and he is where we place our trust. Number three, we serve a sovereign God. And I think I've told you this a couple times before. I do not look at this text and say, I'm gonna squeeze three points into this. I look at it and try to organize it according to what I see. This just happened to be three again. Everlasting God. He is everlasting. Look at the way that he contrasts in 15 through 16. The way that man's lives are gone quickly. And then in verse 
17, the contrast between our lives and the steadfast love of the Lord. He says in verse 17, after he discusses the way in which our lives are gone so quickly, he says the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. I'll tell you, I saw some litter yesterday that I thought looked pretty everlasting, but it is not everlasting in comparison to the character and goodness of God put on display. (laughs) He is truly everlasting. You might say, well, I don't know. There are some plastics that might last forever and go up into the Arctic, maybe for a time. God is truly everlasting and will remain for all of eternity. And the psalmist doesn't just remind us that God himself is everlasting. Guess what it is? It's his steadfast love. It's his chesed, his loyalty, his covenant faithfulness to you and me that is from everlasting to everlasting. But guess what? On those who, what? Fear him. To those who fear him. His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Is that true for your life this morning? Do you walk in fear of the Lord? Do you keep his covenant? Well, if you were in Bible class this morning, which by the way, if you were not, I would commend Pastor Brett's next couple of weeks to you as he walks through continuing acts of worship. But in class this morning, we were looking at these powerful new covenant realities that are true in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, we see that God had a purpose from the beginning and that he was pouring out a new covenant that was realized through Jesus Christ. Verse 18 is a reality that you and I cannot meet. Sorry. You cannot keep his covenant. You can't. You cannot do his commandments. They're too many. Your heart is too weak and you are unable in your humanity. But God, being rich in mercy, has given us his only son. Jesus is faithful. He keeps the covenant. He does the commandments. He wins where Adam failed. He takes victory and dominion back. He does it. And he allows us then to have relationship with him. He builds the bridge and does what you and I cannot do. And so when we look at 18, the temptation is, well, I just need to be a good person. And then I'm gonna receive all the benefits from God. No, forget it. You're gonna lose every single time when you slip into the lie that is simple moralism. It's Jesus. Know Christ, know his benefits. When you know him, when you walk with him, when you have relationship with him, you fear him, you will experience his steadfast love poured out on your life know Christ, know his benefits. He keeps covenant faithfulness. He does all the commandments. He is faithful. Even when he was tempted, he won out. He's able to sympathize with us in our weakness because he was tempted in every way that you and I were as well, Hebrews says, and yet has no sin. So he sympathizes with us. He mediates with us. He is perfect, keeps covenant, does commandments. And then verse 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. God is sovereign in a way that you and I have a hard time understanding sometimes. We're not in control. You're not. Understand that God is, and that's a good thing. Because when I have control over my life, 
I'm gonna make some mistakes, I'm gonna mess some things up because I'm a sinner without Jesus. But when Jesus is in control of my life and he's in control of reality, then his way is perfect. He satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Once again, that's Isaiah 40, by the way. He says in Isaiah 40, verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. God is truly reigning and ruling. First Timothy verse six, verse, chapter six, verse 16, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion, amen. God rules over all, he reigns. He has control. And the psalmist ends in beautiful fashion. He says in verse 20, bless the Lord, O you his angels. If it's not enough for humanity to praise him, guess what? We are entering into a celestial chorus that is going on and that far exceeds anything that we could ever understand. But the angels are praising him, the ones who do his word, and obey the voice of his word. Bless the Lord or praise the Lord, all his hosts. The hosts in eternity past, worshiping the Lord, giving him praise where praise is due. His ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works. So not only do the heavenly angels and beings worship God, but then also all that he has accomplished displays his dominion. You look at the way in which God has been sovereign and in complete control from the beginning of time, his works praise his name. Amen. And then we, at the very end of verse 22, enter back in, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Remember, God is personal. He is a personal God. He walks with us. He crowns us, pours out on us. He satisfies us. He heals us. All of these truths are personal realities, but then we serve a God who is community oriented. He takes care of our church. He asks us as a group to pray, to repent, to walk in forgiveness, to walk in fear of the Lord, to serve him together. And then even beyond that, he is sovereign for all time and is in complete control from the beginning and calls his church to step into this. And we say, we're entering into something that's been going on since eternity past. And then at the very end, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. So the name of the sermon this morning was Know Christ, Know His Benefits. And I'm gonna give credit where credit's due because as I was discussing this with my father last night, he said, well, no Christ, no benefits. And oh, Christ, and oh, benefits. <laughs> I said, amen. The reality is through Jesus, all of this becomes a reality. Yes. Through Jesus, you have the capacity to receive healing and forgiveness in a way that you could never understand. He pours out, and then what should our response be to this eternal almighty one who bestows this covenant love on his people? We have the capacity to enter into praise then of a powerful and awesome God. And so repent, church. Repent and ask God to relent and then praise and worship and say, God, you are good. I love you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He is good, and his word is powerful. I want us to pray. Would you bow your heads with me, and let's talk to the Lord right now.